Tech Talk Tuesday. I see how many folks you get in here today. Let's see who you can see. I'm George. I'm at Star Racing in Tennessee. And this is Tech Talk Tuesday. Charlie, I see you first, brother. <laughs> That's so funny, man. I'm telling you, Charlie, if you didn't show up here first thing at 6 o'clock on uh, Tuesday, Eastern, I would probably have to call the State Patrol and tell them to go to your house. I know I've said that before. Hey, Scott and Dwayne. Hey, y'all. I just wanted to say uh, thank you all for tuning in. Got some good stuff today. I know I say that every Tuesday, but this Tuesday we're going to talk about vacuum pumps. I want to do a little story about it. I'm going to do some history. I'm going, hey, Jim and Chris and Alan and Brian. And uh, I wanted to tell you guys that this uh, vacuum pump, vacuum pump deal has um, a pretty unusual uh, history and it's also so well known yet so well misunderstood and a lot of folks um, have their opinions and this is mine okay this is how I remember the story this is how uh, I learned about the vacuum pump and what I think it's good for and what it what it does and I don't mind sharing it with you guys, and I would love for you to use this information uh, to your benefit or your friend's benefit or just learn about what engines are looking for and what they're asking for and how sometimes an unlikely situation can create an advantage for you and also a disadvantage. Through the history of the vacuum pump on the GS1100, GS1150, KZ1900, the old GPZ Kawasaki's with the roller bearing crankshaft, uh, we've had a lot of people burn up a lot of parts with a vacuum pump and uh, it created two things that happened in the history of the vacuum pumps. One uh, is some really lightweight pistons and really lightweight flexi flyer wrist pins got burned up at the same time the vacuum pumps came out and what we learned at the time was we had uh, parts that were too flimsy to handle the RPM and also the vacuum pump advantages of having the vacuum pump to reduce the crankcase pressure and increase ring seal gave us the flexibility to rev higher than we had. So you had two things working against each other. You had parts that were too flimsy to go higher and you had a vacuum pump that helped seal the rings that allowed the power band to continue to climb at a higher RPM. So the two forces works to work against each other and the vacuum pump got a really, really bad reputation. And rather than fix the flexi flyer parts, a lot of people put regulators on vacuum pumps and they said that's too much vacuum. My uh, engine builder, they're, they're on here right now watching. Some of you aren't watching because some of you don't believe this, but they'll say, you know, 10 inches is all you can run on my engines or 15 inches or 18 inches. And they say too much vacuum is, is detrimental to your performance. And I just want to tell you that we found some different results and I was going to share those with you. Now back to the historical story, back when the late great John Myers was racing pro stock motorcycle with us, we had a really fast Suzuki and I decided that the, our business was growing fast enough and we were getting enough income that I would spend a lot of money and a lot of time on trying to develop the, the package. And, and I had the, the group um, at Vance and Hines were out running everybody and they were winning races. and. Uh, we wanted to beat them. So we did a lot. We worked hard. We worked hard at night. We worked on a lot of things. And John Myers gave me, it was just like I was going down this road trying to run with Vance and Hines and win pro stock. And John Myers came in the, in the, uh, in the blend line and blended into the traffic and he and I connected and together we were faster and we were able to learn faster. We were able to win more often and we became a real thorn in the side of the competition because the combination of how hard we were working and how hard uh, he tried to be the best, it ended up making a great combination. So back to the vacuum pump side of it, Dave Schultz is the first guy I know um, that had some sort of a trick little electric pump and he kept it really secret, kept it really quiet, he kept it for himself for a long time and it took a while for us to catch on because I was, I, I would have never thought that you needed some little electric pump that will pull a vacuum on the crankcase in order to make more horsepower. It just did not add up to me. Until one day, we decided to try it. And 
Paul Gass had this little GM Cadillac pump that he was selling, vacuum pumps cheap. I think it was a hundred bucks. And then the best one we ever saw, and I'll give, give credit where credit is due, uh, Gary Tonglet, uh, Ellie and GT's dad, was came up with a really nice double head. It had one electric engine and it had two little crank cases and two little heads and two little cylinders. So it had a crankshaft, uh, an electric driven crankshaft, and it had two connecting rods and two pistons. And it was a double head thing and it had little um, valves in it and like an air compressor. And they worked in reverse. And he sold those. They were probably $300 back in the day. And um, along came, and they made us go faster. And we didn't really know why, but I mean, you know, if you, you, you leave it, you, your battery goes dead to your vacuum pump and the, and the bike slows down hundreds, you could measure. You're like, wow, you got to find out why. So we dynoed it. And it was a little bit better. I mean, maybe made, like if you were making 200 horse, it would make 202 with the vacuum pump. And I'm like, leave it off, you know, and it would make 200. And you turn it back on, it'd make 202. And, and um, I'm going to get more out of this story in a little bit. But it was like, eh, it was no big deal. But why wouldn't you want 202? If it was worth a hundredth or two hundredths, well, yeah, we're definitely going to run the vacuum pump. So we ran it. And, every, and pretty soon, everybody at the track had one. So everybody was on a level playing field. So along comes the girl. Um, when Angel came to our drag racing school in 1996, uh, she got good. She was good. She got better and better and better. And finally, we, Jackie and I hired her to drive the star racing bike as a teammate to John Myers. And when she got on, on board with us, I think she was, let's see, she was 100 and John was 140. So there was about 35 or 40 pounds difference between them suited. So we ended up putting a lot of lead, a lot of, a lot of ballast on Angel's bike, and we put it all over the place. And when, when we put it in the right place, it would go really fast. It was quick. Everybody had to weigh the same. Everybody had the same size engine, but we didn't know that if you put the weight as far forward and put it as low as you could, that we could leave harder than everybody else. And so uh, at, at one time, we were leaving almost a 1,000 RPM higher than everybody at the starting line with the wheel-driven clutch so that it wouldn't bog. When we put all the weight in the front and she would go to 7,000 RPM and pop the clutch, it would pull the engine down so we'd go up to 7,500, 7,800, all the way up to 8,000 and finally we got it to where it wouldn't bog enough to where it could just keep going. So we were out 60 foot and out accelerating a lot of people because of the weight placement. Now, one thing, uh, and, and you guys are all asking me vacuum pump questions, please stay tuned because there is another 15 minutes probably of what really happens and those questions some of them will be answered so um so let me let me tell you this so i decided one day i said you know if we're going to have 30 or 40 pounds of ballast on this bike why don't we just put more vacuum pumps so we put two pumps on it and it picked up another hundred then we put three vacuum pumps on it and it picked up some more so we put some more batteries on it then we put all of them in the front put all the batteries in the front we made the headers different, and the bike was faster and faster and faster. Well, then we had two motorcycles in 1998, John Myers and Angel. And the two of them couldn't run the same because she was light, had a lot of ballast. He was really good and really fast, and he was on minimum weight. And um, Angel had more vacuum pump and more vacuum. So we could take, our, we had three engines, one for each bike and a spare. And our worst engine would go faster than her bike because she had low center of gravity and drove really good, went nice and straight, shifted on time, and her engine had a little more power because it had more vacuum. So you say a little more vacuum. Well, that's, a, that's um, it's all relative, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach you or tell you or share with you in a minute about how that works. Um, so when we ended up with a lot of vacuum pumps and a lot of ballast that was making more power than just hanging lead out there, uh, there was enough grumbling and gripes coming from the troops that uh, it wasn't fair for Angel to have more vacuum pumps. So NHRA finally decided to change the rule where you can only have one vacuum pump. So I called Bob Blackwell that over the winter that year and I said, so I got to get rid of my vacuum pumps. Yeah, George, I'm sorry to say, but uh, everybody's going to have one vacuum pump. So I says, okay, well, does it matter how big it is? And he says, no, what are you thinking? And I said, well, I'm thinking 10 horsepower, three phase. Uh, I'm thinking about like really jacking this thing up. And I can put, I'll build a motorcycle around this big supercharger vacuum pump that would be hooked to the crankcase and pull vacuum on this engine. And I was, ma I was mad or irritated or a little 
uh, perturbed about having to take my three vacuum pumps off because I got some winds and we were going fast. So we had to come up with a better plan. So we were at Reading that year. I think it was 2000 when they changed the rules and there was a guy there walking around with a star machine shirt on. And I saw in the dragster, in the national dragster, he had a, a star machine. Look what a yellow page ads, business card ads. And I was like, dude, do you know that I've been star racing since 1979 and, and how old is your company? He said, oh, we just opened. And I said, well, why did you steal my deal? And he said, I didn't steal your deal. And I said, well, well now, now in NHRA, there's only 50,000 or 70,000 of us out here and I got star racing and you got star machine and we're not related in any way. And people are calling you because you're buying ads. So Jackie and I had to buy ads so in National Directors so we would have a presence while Steve at, at Star Machine was getting calls. And I asked him at Reading that day, I said, Steve, what, what do you sell? He said, we sell vacuum pumps. And I said, vacuum pumps? He said, yeah. He said, you know that junk everybody's running? That stuff doesn't work, man. He said, These, this is a company specific for crankcase evacuation and making high efficient vacuum pumps for your engine performance. And I'm like, okay. So if, if we have the same name and we have two different phone numbers and you're selling vacuum pumps and now we're selling racing engines, people will call you and I will sell them a vacuum pump. People will call you and you can tell them to call me. And if people call me, I'll sell them a vacuum pump. He said, yes. So guess what? Star Racing started selling Star Machine vacuum pumps. Ended up being a pretty good deal because at the time, for sure it was the best. And let me explain it to you. He put this really big, powerful motor on it, an electric motor with a little pulley, and he put a, a, a homemade, not homemade, but a really nice anodized Teflon, big piston. I mean, this thing had a big piston. It might have been two or three inches in diameter, the piston on this vacuum pump. And it had really nice rings. It had a nice Teflon bore, and it had connecting rods in it. And this vacuum pump, he could the electric motor, he could spin it really fast. And by changing the pulleys on the pump and on the motor, he could make the vacuum pump go faster and faster and faster. And the first day we got one, it was heavy, it was big, but it fit in the bottom of a motorcycle really nice, but it made 25 inches of vacuum. And we had just lived through all the flexible lightweight wrist pins with two rings, uh, pistons with two rings and, and no, um, no, no uh, height to them. Compression height's really short. We were running the wrist pin up high, and we had these little 080 tool steel wrist pins that were little flexible flyers. We didn't know at 13, 12, 13,000 RPM these push rods, these wrist pins were bending. And they would bend enough that the piston would flex and the piston would explode off of the wrist pin. And we didn't know any better. So uh, by, um, by 1993 and 19, no, yeah, that's when I learned all that stuff back in the early 90s about the lightweight parts. But we had lived through that, and now we had substantial parts, and we could stand lots and lots of vacuum. So, here, let me put a little lube in the pipes here right quick. Hang on. So Steve and I got to be pretty good friends. His name is Steve Fackett. He owned um, Star Machine, I think he sold it now, moved out. There's another guy who has it now, but they still, since 2001 and 2002, they make some of the very best vacuum pumps. You can go starmachine.com or something like that. I don't know their address now, but there's no affiliation between us other than we always use their product because it worked. And along the way, I noticed that even the ProSock cars that had the, the several-stage belt-driven pumps for uh, supply to the oil to their engines and the scavenge from their car, car, man, pen, uh, compartmental oil pans where they had four compartments. They had two cylinders in the back, two cylinders in the middle, two cylinders in the middle, two cylinders in the front, and they had them comp compartmentalized to where they had four vacuum pumps that would pull vacuum on each bank, each pair of cylinders. Hey, David, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And Mike and Scott. So what, what we learned along all these times was they would found out how much power was gained with good vacuum and good ring seal and the RPM improved that this brought us. They were able to run these uh, star electric pumps and they would hide them in quarter panels. They would hide them somewhere in the side of the car. And they would have, um, we had drill batteries, electric drill motor batteries 
that we could charge and keep them charging and you just pull one battery out, like a like a 18 volt Milwaukee battery. Or the, um, <laughs> anyway, there were lots of batteries that you could just buy, um, like a, I'm, I think a Makita, I don't remember the name of them, but, they, but the, you would keep your 18 volt or your 20 volt or your 14 volt or 15 volt batteries, these little drill motor batteries that you would keep them in a charger and every round you just stick another one in and um, if anybody could hear it, you would wait till you fire the car up, wait till you do the burnout, and maybe while you're backing up in the ProStock car, you flip all the switches on and turn on all the vacuum pumps. But the cool thing is, is we got in on the ground floor on that, and we lived through the flexi parts that would burn up. We lived through the growth and the popularity of the vacuum pump. And I want to talk about a couple of the misconceptions and the misunderstood uh, concept of the vacuum pump and the dyno dyno results and I'm going to move the screen over here to the table and I will also show you that this is now Tech Talk number 102 and I did a proposed dyno curve. I don't know if you can see this okay. Let me raise it up one more click and see if that helps. Okay. On a dyno sheet, we always see this curve, the dyno, the power curve. Then here's a typical torque curve. And as I've told you 100 times, they cross at 52, 52 RPM. On a pro stock engine, we only run over here. On a Harley street bike, we run over here. Some street cars, we run left of 5,200. So torque is so important. And horsepower is kind of important. But if you move over here to 10,000, 11,000, 12,000 RPM, these early numbers are not as important. Now, I didn't, this is just a typical dyno curve. So, what we've seen in our history is guys that dyno and girls that dyno is they stop the pull at peak. Like here's peak horsepower, that's where they'll, they won't go over here. This is where the dyno sheet stops. So if we go and look at dyno sheets all over the internet, you can see that if you have a square piece of paper and the dyno curve looks like this. That's the horsepower curve, and here's the torque curve. And that's what the dyno sheet looks like. We see them every day. You see them on the internet all the time. I want to know, and, so, and the pro stock car guys and the pro stock motorcycle guys, they operate over here. They operate over here. Yes, peak is still peak. But you, uh, if you have a professional race team and you're running at NASCAR and you're running down the front straightaway, you're not going to let off when you get to peak horsepower. No, you want to hit peak horsepower in the middle, of, halfway down the straightaway and over rev it into turn one. If you go into at the drag strip and you got a five speed, you have to over rev every gear so that you come back over here in the next gear. You over rev this gear and you come back over here so that you can let your peak horsepower be somewhere in the middle. Why is that important with the vacuum pump story? Well, without the vacuum pump and just really nice pistons and really nice rings, our horsepower curve kind of looks like this. And if you put a vacuum pump on this same engine on the dyno, you see a gain here, you see a little gain here, and you see a little gain here, and you see a little gain here. And when you finish dynoing, you say, I picked up 30 horsepower with my vacuum pump. If it's a pro stock car or a really fast V8, if it is a pro stock motorcycle, you might pick up 10 horsepower or maybe 20 horsepower. But if you leave, if we if we had a pro stock motorcycle that was going 680s and we forgot to turn the vacuum pump on or the battery went dead, it would slow down one tenth. In other words, you could be number two qualifier, and without the vacuum pump, you could be number 16 qualifier just with a vacuum pump. Think about that for a minute. Number one qualifier, number two qualifier with the pump turned on and pulling vacuum going down the track in five, six gears, or the battery goes dead and you don't make any vacuum on that run. And instead of having crankcase evacuation, you now have crankcase pressure and you slow down at least a tenth. So if you go 680, now you go 690. So you may qualify from number two or number one or number two, and you'll go all the way to the back of the pack if you forgot to turn the vacuum pump on or if you left it home. Now, here is why. 
and this is just my opinion and what I think I've learned, and some of you know this, but this is news to some folks. With the vacuum pump on, the curve would look like this. Yes, it's only worth a little more horsepower because we only measure it at peak. But what about a 1,000 RPM past peak? What if I told you it was twice as much there? Instead of it being 30 horsepower different at peak, it could be 60 horsepower peak at shift point or at the finish line. And if you're a normally aspirated racer, NASCAR, Pro Stock Car, Pro Stock Motorcycle, or some of these other Comp Eliminator style classes, you don't want to give away that much. I mean, that's a large percentage. So why does it do it, y'all? Why? Well, it hasn't had a good chance in general engine building in history because people dyno to here. So they don't know about this. Now, in my racing, we've always used a G-meter to set shift points by. And if the dyno said that you only turn it 13,000, and we qualify number 16, and then if we turn it 14,000 and we qualify number one, and then if you dyno it, of course, nobody would dyno it there. It doesn't make any power. I mean, if you had an engine that, di that peaked horsepower at 13,000 and you turn it 14,000, you're over here killing it. The problem is at the racetrack, you are. You're going over here to come back here. You're going over here to come back here. First gear, second gear, third gear, fourth gear. You're running through these gears, through peak horsepower. So you've got a, a horsepower gain early in the gears, you've got a horsepower gain at peak, and you've got a giant horsepower gain at shift point with your vacuum pump. So that's why I, George Bryce, am all about ring seal, and that's why I believe that piston speed and ring weight and ring seal is sometimes not measured in the laboratory as well as it could be. It is measured at the racetrack. It is in a dynamic situation. So I preach today that dynamic thinking, excuse me, static thinking in a dynamic environment makes you go really, really slow. So there's a lot going on at the racetrack that you can't really duplicate on the drag strip. And I know everybody knows that. But if you give a guy, if you dyno this guy's motorcycle and it makes peak power at 6,000 RPM and you set his rev limiter at 6,200 RPM, I'm going to outrun him because his dyno curve will look like this. And this is where peak is. And you set his rev limiter here. And when I race him with the same motorcycle or he lets me ride it, I'm going to, first thing I'm going to do is move the rev limiter out of the way. We got to get the TTS, man. You got to move the rev limiter. You're going to have to move it about 800. We're going to set the rev limiter over here. And I'm going to wind it up in low gear, get low gear until it goes, da, 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 and then come back to here. And then I'm going to wind it up, da, da, da. And then I'm going to wind it up to the rev limiter. Da, da, da. And what I've done is I have increased the area under the curve by a ton of horsepower and performance. I don't know if that makes sense to you guys, but let's go to the mechanics of the ring seal deal. All right, here's our piston. There's our gas ports. We run top gas ports halfway the hole, halfway in the back, halfway the depth. We run our gas ports through the top, halfway down of the ring width, and halfway of the back of the ring so that we can actually get this combustion pressure back here to blow this ring out. Now, this ring is on a shelf stock piston. A lot of times this ring is in here pretty loose and it's flopping around. And the G-forces of this piston going up and down, the piston goes up and stops, the ring keeps going. The piston goes down and stops, the ring keeps going. So the tighter, the tighter this clearance is in this ring land right here, the longer, higher the RPM is, you can rev the engine without losing ring seal. You see this clearance? If you blew up the piston big enough, you would see a ton of clearance here. This is room for this ring to go up and down and lose seal because the seal is only coming 
where the ring is mated to the bottom of this piston. That's why this ring land is so important in its finish, and the finish on this ring is so important. That's why I love the brand pistons we use, and you get the guys at, at uh, all the great piston companies to do a nice, high, high, uh, a, a really nice, straight, smooth finish on the ring lands, and, the, and also get Total Seal does a wonderful job diamond grinding the uh, bottom of the rings and the top of the rings so that you have a really nice finish to keep that ring seal. Now the vacuum, the reason we have, the reason this works is you've got this second ring here, which is a scraper. And then you got the three piece oil ring. <laughs> My markers are running out of gas. And your vacuum comes up inside this piston it's out here on, under the rings, and it's inside the piston, and there's a drain back hole in here, and you want this vacuum to pull through here, and you want it to pull by here, and you want it to come up and get vacuum, put vacuum under all of this, and pull vacuum under the bottom of this ring, so that when this ring goes to that RPM where the horsepower noses over, where the horsepower noses over, if you have 20 inches of depression 20 inches of crankcase vacuum under this top ring. If you have that under this top ring, this fall off after peak horsepower will be less. So you have a lot more power after peak. It's hard to measure it on the dyno because we only go to peak, but if you go way past the peak and you start working on why you lost ring seal, another thing you can do is if you're racing down the racetrack, you guys, and you're going down the track and you see you got a crankcase pressure in your on your v300 and you're going down the track in every gear it looks like this every gear the vacuum's going down it's going down closer to the finish line that's because you keep going past peak keep going past peak horsepower and if you don't have good ring seal and if you don't have vacuum you're just wasting time over here yes you still get area under the curve but the area under the curve is narrower than it is if you've got big crankcase vacuum and big ring seal. I know that's not very well explained and maybe it's a little bit over some of you's head, but if you've ever wondered why, when somebody tells you that a vacuum pump is to suck the bottom of the pistons to, keep, to help them pull down and get rid of the area in the crankcase, that's an opinion that I don't agree with, but um, it is, uh, what I use vacuum pump for is to counteract the ring seal that's being lost. The crankcase pressure above the top ring eventually is going to go by the top ring. And the more vacuum you have under the top ring, the longer that ring stays sealed. And if you have less pressure vacuum under this top ring, if you have less under it, then this will float in the piston and your ring seal goes away as soon as the crankcase pressure goes by. So you get to stretch your RPM out further and you make more power up high. Tech Talk 102, uh, glazed over the vacuum pump deal. It's gonna create a bunch of questions. Um, email me, message me, text me. Uh, what is my Georgia, uh, my new email, not new, but it's the one that I respond to the most. Is It's easy, it's George Bryce at Bell South. Dot net. George Bryce at bellsouth.net. Also, I am on the Messenger on the Facebook page, and I respond to those. It's at my page at George, uh, George Bryce on Facebook. And uh, I love sharing this info with you guys. I see there's a lot of smart people on here that know what I'm talking about. There's a lot of smart people on here that don't know what I'm talking about. There's a lot of people on here that know more about what I'm talking about. So I'm right in the middle of this stuff, and uh, I love sharing it with you. So thank you all for watching. Uh, may God bless, and please give me feedback, you guys. Please give me feedback. I need to know what you know, what you think about what I'm saying. I would like to know what you want me to talk about, and I would like to explain further because this is just trying to share what I think I know. And please understand, you guys, this is my opinion, not everybody else's, because everybody has one. Like I said, thank you all. Have a great night. Check back next Tuesday for Tech Talk 103.